Hi guys, welcome back. This is Bat Chat number 94, featuring part two of my interview with the fabulous Augustine Cordes, uh, the designer of Scratches and the upcoming Asylum, two of the scariest adventure games you'll ever play. Uh, now, this part of the interview, we talk about the uh, horror film versus the horror game, how to tell a good story in the game, uh, th what makes the, uh, the adventure game genre unique, and much, much more. Over 40 minutes more, as a matter of fact. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Augustine Cordes. What do you what do you think is the relationship between movies and games? Uh, do you see a similar process, or are they completely different? That's an interesting question. Um, I'll just put it in the context. So, what if it was what if you had made Scratches the movie instead of uh, Scratches the game? I remember that when when designing Scratches, I was thinking about okay, uh, how to make this movie like. One of the one of the key sequences in, in the game perhaps it kind of unfolded like in a movie. When you go inside the the boiler in the in the basement, that's perhaps the most infamous scene of the game. And I was when I was thinking about that, I, I tried to to put myself in the place of the player or viewer in that in that case and think okay he's of course he's trying to move forward so when he when he goes past this point we put this music and when he goes past this point we turn off the light and um, you know when thinking about that type of sequences perhaps yes uh, there is a certain connection between movie and games but I wouldn't say that the process is very similar or perhaps like I, like, like I said, you have these uh, very specific situations, but overall the approach is quite different because uh, in, in a movie you know very well that the player is going to look at this first, then this, then this. Not in a game when the player starts here, but it can it can go here or here or, or here. It's kind of you you have to think about all the possible outcomes from uh, from an action. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely approach the process with uh, with a certain, I don't know, uh, sensibility to, to 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 make things more uh, cinematic. That's a you know really interesting point about the the movies, because uh, I was thinking you know most of the time I watch a horror film, and the characters do such stupid things, and I'm thinking I would. No, don't go outside, you know, so in a game, I guess you would just, what if the player just doesn't go outside? <laughs> I mean, it seems like horror movies have to rely on them all doing stupid things. Yes, it, it, it's true. It's true. Um, if, if you think about it, I mean, would you have entered that boiler in the basement? I mean, of course not. Perhaps if you were watching a movie, you would say, no, Michael, are you insane? You can't go in there. Are you stupid? Uh... So yes, it's quite an interesting analogy because in the end, uh, we as gamers are doing the very stupid things that people do in movies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you you have to move forward the story in some way. I mean, uh, at, at one point, people are bound to do stupid things. <laughs> you know, uh, if they were all intelligent, they are uh, they will they will probably I don't know uh, leave the house and forget about the ghost. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, Michael as a character because this was I thought this was one of really one of the most interesting aspects of the game. Uh, so many adventure games and really just games in general the the character that you play is this very generic a uh, blank slate kind of guy sort of every man. Uh, Michael though has got a very well defined personality he's very uh, eccentric I think the term uh, ultimate, um, unreliable narrator comes into play. Mm. Uh, so you can just uh, tell us a little bit about Michael as a character. Well, um, one of the biggest criticisms about the first adventures is exactly that they they are blank slates. You know, um, in in a way, I wanted to prove with Scratch that you can definitely have uh, a well-defined character as the protagonist, and um, it was difficult. Uh, 
uh, because as we were we were discussing, first person adventures tend to give you a lot of freedom. So uh, my approach, you know, to to make Michael a well-defined character was to okay, let's put feedback, you know, uh, lots of feedback, and um, you know, show the players what kind of characters they were playing with with those comments. Um, I think that in the case of horror, um, well, in the case of any game with a good story, to tell the truth, I think that uh, you, you you need to have a, a good character because people are bound to care for him or her. And when you care for, you know, what's going to happen to that character, it's like, the story is more effective for you. Um, I really like that concept of a reliable narrator. Um, one thing I like the most about those characters is that it's like they have their own dark secrets. If you think about it, uh, no human being ever says what he or she is really think about. Um, that's the key. In fact, that, that's the key to, to write really, really powerful dialogue, maybe. Just put yourself in, in the skin of that character and not only think about what he's or she's actually saying, but what is going inside the mind of that character. What I, what I tried to do with, with Michael was to sort of replicate that behavior like uh, okay Michael is saying this or he's looking at this and he's commenting about this but what is really going on inside his mind I, I think that is what perhaps freaked out players like okay uh, is this really happening or is Michael going insane uh, that extra kind of extra layer of of, of freakiness, uh, I think that it was it was it works really good in horror. I have been reading a lot of uh, Christopher Priest lately. He's a writer that he, he's the master at writing unreliable characters, and um, I like the effect. Yes, it's like I I I, I love playing with people's mind in that, re that regard, maybe, yes? Have you thought about making a game with a, a female protagonist or a gay protagonist? Oh yeah, I remember, remember we, we, we discussed that. Um, I, in my case, I haven't thought about a story that would, I don't know, work best with a woman or a gay or a gay character, I would certainly do it. I mean, if, if I if I suddenly come up with with a story that um, works better with such a character, I would definitely do it. Um, last time, you specifically asked me if I thought that people would have uh, prejudices against the gay character, and uh, I think not. I think not because, fortunately, the you know, the adventure gamer is a very it tends to be a very intelligent gamer. So I don't think they would they would mind. Uh, but I I wouldn't want you know to do it gratuitously. I mean, to me, it should have a, a reason to put a gay character because if not, I mean, why? So, uh, I don't know, in, in my case, that's at least what I would think of. Now here's an interesting quotation that I found from an earlier interview. I just love this uh, quotation here, it's about adventure games. And, uh, you had said that adventure games are the only game genre that has historically focused on the story while pushing the gameplay to the background. To me, they shouldn't even be considered a game genre at all. I long for the day when players buy a game for its plot description alone without any sort of expectations. And that's a really uh, controversial point, I'm sure. Uh, it seems like everybody's, most game critics are obsessed with this idea of gameplay. Uh, so can you, you know, t explain what you were saying there and maybe develop that a little bit? 
Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, why I think adventures don't make good games? What's what people look for in games? I mean, they... Okay, first of all, they, they want to have a good time, okay? But, uh, generally, you expect the game to be, I don't know, to, to have replayability or a lasting appeal, as some reviewers say. Um, you know, like, okay, I went through it, can I do better? Next time, can I beat my score? I mean, if you if you think about it, most most of most current games, most games have those aspects. Or you have achievements. Uh, yeah, you can share your score with uh, with your friends. And adventures are completely unlike that. Adventures have have always been about go through the story. And um, yeah, what's the lasting appeal of the story? You you either liked it. Or not, okay? Uh, you, you, it's not like you can replay a story. You, you can re-experience the story, but it's going to be uh, at least basically the same all the time. I mean, when you watch a movie, you watch it once. You can watch it all the times you want. But the movie remains the same. Um, so, what I was saying in a way was that, yeah. People, not the not I mean not the adventure gamer that you know tends to play many adventures, but non-adventurers tend to look for the wrong things in adventure. Like uh, okay, so that's it. Uh, nothing is going to change. Where's my score? Uh, I always, you know, IGN.com. When they review games, they have this section at the end of the review, which is the lasting appeal, that that uh, score. And in adventures, the lasting appeal is always a four or a five because they put it. And it's like okay, but once you play it, there's not much to do. Okay, I don't care. I mean, that's perhaps. Um, in, in that regard, perhaps adventures are like movies or books. Okay, yeah, you, you watch the movie. What do you expect? Go to the extras. Okay, fine, but that's the movie, okay? So this is the adventure. There's nothing more to it, and that's fine. Uh, but yes, perhaps they, they don't make good games because of that reason. Uh, games are about winning or losing, about beating your score, Uh and there's nothing like that in adventures. I think that that's basically what I what I meant with that quote. Uh, well, when you go watch a movie, okay, you, you know that uh, it's going to be horror or sci-fi or drama. You, I mean, you do choose. But in the case of games, it's like you look at the at the general not the genre of the plot, but the plot of the game. So, okay, I'm going to buy a strategy game. And I, I know what to expect from a strategy game. Um, so perhaps when I was referring about that in the case of adventures was that I long for the day when people just, we, okay, what's this game about? And play it without expectations, okay? I'm not expecting you know, uh, to beat puzzles. I'm just expecting to play this plot. Not going to happen. I know you've been critical of other genres that try to tell a story with cutscenes, and in particular the uh, Metal Gear Solid uh, game. I remember you uh, called it a... said it had fairly generic gameplay interceded with endless cutscenes telling a convoluted and rehashed story. So... I, you think there's the adventure games are just better at telling stories, and these other genres are just stay away from it. Yes, definitely. Um, the reason is perhaps that exactly uh, in the same in the same way that players have expectations about the genre, designers 
first think about, okay, this is, this is going to be the genre of my game. I'm going to make a first-person shooter. Okay, now let's put the story to it. You are uh, definitely going to be influenced by the genre of the game. So at some point in your story, you're going to have to shoot people. Uh, the same goes for strategy, the same goes for role-playing games. I mean, your character has to evolve in role-playing role games because that's, uh, that's how the genre works. You start with a weak character, you end with a very powerful character. So it takes away freedom from the designing process when you first think about the genre of the game. Uh, in the case of adventures, you, you have much more liberty in that regard because you think about the story first. I have this story in my mind. Perhaps you think about certain obstacles that may be compassels uh, or not because you can easily do a game that's only in interaction. We have seen games like, 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 like those. Uh, yeah, they're... Perhaps they are not even games. And, uh, the Dark Eye is a fantastic example for me. I love that game, but I, I would call it a multimedia experience. So, um, yes, the problem today, as I see it, is that most designers think about the genre first. Uh, it's the requirement, I don't know. Uh, you know, that's how the industry works, unfortunately. But um, I think that, yes, adventures are better at telling stories because you, you don't have to think about the gameplay first. First, you iron out your story, and then you try to adapt the gameplay to that story. That's the key difference with other games. I know a lot of people who watch the show are interested in making their own games and designing, getting into game design. Some of them already are, of course. And you've got a quotation here I thought was really was really insightful. You talked about uh, thinking of uh, developing an adventure game uh, the same way or the as the work a novelist does, revising and rewriting the initial draft as they see fit. So you know, I guess you sort of get in there and start making it, and then make a lot of changes as you go along. Uh, I mean, do you think that's a, a realistic way to go about uh, designing an adventure game? Uh, well, you're not going to give me a hard time explaining all, all those quotes, but okay, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, I think that, yes, you should have some, some more liberty when designing adventures that primarily focus on the story. Um, you know, a novelist or a, or a movie scripter, when they when they start thinking about the, their stories, they use these these cards with uh, that describe the sequences. You know, they just put a small description and arrange the cards and see how the story plays out. Uh, they have that flexibility. In the case of the game, however, of course, you, you can't do that because you, you can't, in the middle of the, of the development, uh, suddenly switch cards because you have more than words. You have uh, resources to, 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 to think in advance. Uh, you, you have to think about the cutscenes. You can't make those drastic changes. Um, but I think that, yes, you, you can... Uh, take some liberty to do to the changes if you think your story will work better. Uh, we did that in, in Scratches, for instance. I mean, uh, first, Scratches was going to have two floors only, you know, the, floor, the level floor, floor level, and the first floor. Um, when we started testing the game, we realized that mm, this is a you know, it's too short, maybe we could include this and that, and uh, we, we created a whole new floor. So that wasn't on the design document, uh, that was a change in the middle of the development. Um, I mean, yeah, you, you can do that with other games, maybe, you know, put an extra level if you, are, uh, if you want to make it longer. Uh, 
but not if you're working working with a publisher, only if you are an indie, you know. Um, what I was going to say is that I was thinking about uh, something that Scott Murphy said, you know, Scott Murphy from, from Sierra. Um, he said that, I love that, that quote, that the, the kind of development in Sierra Online was, what was that word? Seat of the pants type of development. That, okay, we start making the game and we see how it plays out. I think that's a great approach. Uh, perhaps not to that extent of, you know, uh, I'm going to sit down and start developing and see, see what comes out. I mean, you, know, you, you certainly have to have a goal. You have to have, you have, to have a, a draft of your story, of your design. Um, but it's great and it's, it gives you flexibility to, you know, perhaps pro pro prototype first, see how, you know, the look and feel of the game and um, you know, fine tune the the story or or the storyline according to to those uh, uh, aspects of the game. So I think that that's what I was more or less uh, kind of uh, meaning with that quote. Uh, don't do one extreme or the other. I mean, don't uh, start with a you know design document that it's like a locket box that you won't be able to do any changes to it. But don't start either uh, without a goal in mind. I mean, you can start in between and uh, see things, uh, development progresses. I thought of something that I wanted to ask. We talked about it last time and I forgot about it. Was I think people would be surprised uh, to know that Scratch is the house uh, that that wasn't actually based on a, a house that you went to or, or were familiar with, right? This was all uh, done created through research, right? No, no, it was uh, completely created from uh, research. I mean, uh, it's not. Uh, I, in fact, we we don't have when we were designing the game, we uh, we saw if we had any Victorian houses here in Argentina that at least, you know. Uh, met certain goals that we re required, you know, it has to be from this era, it has to be uh, run down. Uh, no, we, we don't have houses like that here. Uh, at least we didn't find them. So yeah, the, the whole design was based on photographs, uh, blueprints that we Googled. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that may su surprise people. It, it was completely built from the ground with reference only, yeah. What is the game development scene like in Argentina? Do you feel like you're well supported, or are you sort of the lone, the lone wolf? <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of lone wolf. I, um, I mean, w when we began scratches, uh, it was the industry was quite small. We were, well, it's not like we were one of the first, but uh, when we started, it was. Uh, I don't know how's the English word for that, but it was beginning, okay? Uh, it's in much better shape now. I think that it, it's grown, I don't know, 10 times since we began with scratches. And um, I can't say that I really like the games that we do here. Um, I mean, I think that perhaps we, they mostly focus on, on, on advert gaming or uh, what's your type of game? Yeah, too casual, maybe. But the industry is doing well. Uh, and, and I think that we have a lot, a lot of uh, potential here. But yeah, I'm more of a long wolf, so don't, don't quote me on this. No. You did a game for the government, a uh, oh, profile yeah, that, that was... Uh, Pretty zany game. I think people would be interested to know more about that. Unfortunately, not available in an in English version. No, the game was called Risk Profile, and um, it was an amazing experience, you know, to to do something like that because it was huge. Like you say, it was commissioned by the government. Uh, it was a, quite a huge deal at the time because uh, I think that there there never was quite something like 
like it, you know, uh, government actually asking for an adventure game. I was like, whoa, I want to be in that project. Um, but I want to do it again because um, it was quite com complicated. I mean, you, you had, of course, to respond to the, the whims of... of um, uh, this was a game to pay, you know, to teach kids, you know, why they must pay taxes. Uh, it sounds quite awful on paper, but it, it, it was fun to do. Um, we also had to educate them, you know, about being good citizens. So it's like, okay, um, we have to put that in the game somehow. I mean, and, and you have to do it my way. That, that's what I was trying to, to say. I mean, you, you had to do what they said in that, re, that regard. I mean, that was the educational part. Um, on top of it, they also had certain expectations. Um, you know, it has to look good. They wanted to be to have a, a character that that kids like, that they can identify with. Um, she was called Martina, and um, it's like we. I think that we did her four times, maybe until everybody was happy with, with her. Uh, so that, that that was a great deal of, of work. Uh, even worse, they, they wanted the game in one year. We took one year and a half to the game, and in reality, it should ha it should have been made in two years. You know, like uh, things were very tight in that project. However, we had a lot of fun. With, I mean, we, I I can honestly say that we really loved doing some of those sequences. Um, in that regard, we had complete liberty. So for as long as we, uh, you know, fulfill their expectations with the educational part, we had, you know, carte blanche on the humor. And we went bananas with the humor. I mean, really crazy stuff. Um, I was even... You know, I, I must admit that I'm I'm surprised that some of those jokes made it into the game. Uh, at one point, you have to create beer out of car oil and a box of cereals. Uh, I mean, this was a, a game for the kids. I mean, if you know what I mean. Uh, so okay, the. You know, the, the only, they only requested that we remove the word beer. And that's all that they asked. But we could keep the puzzle. Uh, they, there's also a captain of a boat that's uh, kind of crazy. And he's, he's haunted by this seagull. You know, instead of Moby D, he's afraid of, of, of a seagull. And yeah, he had this rubber parrot in his, in his shoulder. I mean, all, all kinds of freaky stuff. At one point of the game, uh, Cthulhu makes an appearance, you know, long tentacles uh, embracing a building. I mean, that sort of crazy stuff. So it's a shame that it never made it to the, you know, that it wasn't translated because in spite of the educational parts, uh, which were, you could say, lightweight, the game was really, really fun. Yeah. I know you would mentioned you've seen that Scott Steinberg video. He talks a lot in there. He's got all those interviews. He's got all those interviews with designers about how the big publishers are preventing creativity. There's no, everything's a sequel. There's no originality. And I was wondering what you thought about the, the future of indie games in particular. Do you think that uh, this is a market that's going to be expanding and there'll be more opportunities? Yes. Definitely yes. Um, what you say about the, the lack of liberty in the case of publishers. Unfortunately, it's happening everywhere. I mean, uh, I re remember re reading about that in the case of movies as well, that uh, last year was the, the record for sequels, for either sequels or remakes. Um, I think that's a product of, you know, game development just costing too much money. No, that's like... Uh, 
gamers ask for more, publishers have to invest more money and they want to make sure that, uh, you know, they can expect revenues out of that game. So, unfortunately, you know, uh, design loses in that because, um, yeah, publishers take away that freedom. It's their money. You can blame them. Uh, indies don't have that problem. Indies, you know, kind of in the case of adventures, they just think about the game they want to make. Um, and it's great. I think the, the indie saying is saving the entire industry because except for, uh, I, I'm tempted to say, five major games uh, in one year, uh, the rest is forgettable. And uh, But the indies are making really fantastic stuff. Uh, World of War, Ray, BBB, BBB, they're fantastic games, really. And, um, I, and you know, with, with the smashing success of the iPhone, the iPad, which are devices that um, they are kind of like fertile grounds for indie games. Uh, in fact, the, the, the most the most successful games in those platforms have been indie games. So I think that, yeah, that, that's maybe the future of the in industry. I mean, those kind of games. Have you thought about designing uh, the new game for the iPad? I know the iPad 2 just came out and got yeah. a lot of buzz. Have you thought about targeting that? Uh, well, the, the engine, X Kinesis, um, we, we, we're doing the port for iPad. So, yeah, you can definitely expect Asylum on the iPad. Um, yeah, I, I do have a couple of ideas that I would like to explore sometime when we are done with all of this. So, yeah, yeah, I, 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 like, I really like the device. Uh, I, I think it's perfect for adventures because you have this... I mean, you can have this intimate... intimate um, relationship with the device that you you don't have uh, or you don't tend to have with a computer or a, or, or a console. Uh, consoles are in the living room and it's mostly for show off games. That's the truth. And you can quote me on that because I'm uh, I'm really convinced of that. I mean, you you, you can't have low key games or, or 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 really intimate experiences on on consoles, but you can on the iPad. That's what, what, what I love about the device. It's like uh, we were talking with some developers a uh, while ago that for the first time, at, the, at least in the case of adventures, we have the readers right where we wanted to in this device. The, the iPad is, is it's being used to read a lot. And uh, I have all, I've always thought that people who read a lot are people that enjoy adventure. So, uh, yeah, it's a magical device in that regard. It's like... A, it's three o'clock. Okay, it's three o'clock now. <laughs> okay. Just thinking of all the interesting puzzles that could be built with the uh, gyroscopes and the multi-touch and everything, I mean got to be a lot of interesting possibilities there that as an adventure game designer must have probably yeah. keeps you awake at night. Well, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but I, I don't like when things become, you know, too jicky or what's the word? No, gimmicky. Or gimmicky. Um, it's like, okay, I have to use this because it will spice up things. I mean, if yeah, if I can think of a puzzle that really, like we were talking before, it definitely integrates with the story and it uses the, the gyro or the accelerometer. Um, if I can use them in a way that, um, you know, help the story, uh, yeah, I would. I wouldn't create a game to use those things, if you know what I, if you know what I mean. Uh, only if they work in the context of the game. 
uh, we're saying something over the email about a big fish. Uh, you can get scratches over big fish now. So if you want to talk okay. a little bit about... Um, it's, it's been launched. Yeah, it's on big fish now. Um, it's fun. I, I have been tweeting about that because people are very fun about the game. Uh, it's actually nice to touch this because um, it really falls in between what we were discussing before. Uh, some people bought scratches with expectations. They they thought it was a, a hog or a hidden object game. And yeah, it's totally unlike a hidden object game. Uh, well, those people are hating scratches. Others can play because it makes them, makes them feel dizzy. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, others are loving the game, really. Uh, because I think that they just like the description. They didn't know what to expect. And they are asking, they are asking Big Fish for more games like it. Hey, I, I want more adventure games, I mean, if this is an adventure game. Uh, and that's a really cool thing. Uh, I, I want to say it was a smashing, you know, launch, because, uh, yeah, if you look at the comments, it's like uh, half are hating the game, half are loving it. Uh, but it's very interesting, yes. That's an interesting point about the comments. I was, I've been reading a book called Convergence Culture, and the author talks a lot about how uh, shows like Survivor Part of what drives them is the internet, and people get on and have these extensive discussions about what's going to happen. And I, I noticed that I don't think I've ever noticed another game besides Scratches where the players have done that. I was uh, looking at the Scratches forums, and of course, there's a lot of you know, just page after page of speculation about the ending of the game, <laughs> and so yeah. you know, all these mysteries yeah. in the game. So, I mean, did you intentionally do that to try to spark that kind of uh, conversation? I wouldn't say it was intentional to, to spark the conversation. What, what I did want to have with the ending of Scratches was um, was to make the players think about the story. So when you have an ending that it's like all laid out for you, you know, uh, this is what happened, it's like, okay, that's the end of the story, uh, on to another game. They forget about it. You have to shake them up a bit, you know, uh, leave something to their imagination because that, I think that's when stories work, when, when people think about them. Um, the, all the discussion, I, I'm, I'm still humbled by all that follow, follow scratches. I'm still surprised to this day because uh, people uh, are still discussing that story. Uh, come on, enough is enough, guys. <laughs> but um, no, I think it was amazing, and, and that really, I think that the key was to have, you know, yeah, leave something to their imagination. Seems like a great approach to uh, drive up the sales. Well, that also works. Yes, <laughs> of course. It's still surprising. So you were you were genuinely surprised when scratches became a hit. Yes, very. I mean, uh, it was completely unexpected, and I uh, I can say it again because uh, Scratches was built from the ground um, as a game for the hardcore adventure gamer. You know, it was challenging. It was, uh, you know, slow, very very slow, in fact. But I don't know why. Still to this day, I don't know why. But a lot of people loved it, and people that have never played adventures in the first place. We are seeing it in Big Fish now, which is a completely new audience to the game. Uh, I don't understand. I really don't understand. I think that um, maybe it's the way the story unfolds, how they feel part of it. I don't know what it is, but yes, it was a success. I know what it is. Yeah? I said, I what? know what Sorry. it is. It's a great what? game. Do you know the script? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I guess that's, uh, that's it. Unless you, do you have anything you'd like to add or any um, last uh, comments? Um, oh, yeah, last time I gave you another scoop. Okay, you have 
two scoops today. The engine name is going to change. It's going to be open source. It's going to be free. It's going to be a huge announcement because it will. You can expect a demo with the announcement of the engine. Um, also, I have been working on a small project with a very uh, renowned adventure game designer. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, allowed to say anything else about it, but I, I think that it's going to be a very fun diversion, hopefully coming very soon. Famous, you're working with yes. a famous game designer. Yes. Is it a man yes. or woman? A man. A man that you know, even. But I can't man say anything else. before. <laughs> a man of mystery. <laughs> Fueling the That's speculation. Yeah. It's, it's not a game. game. It's not a game. Okay, just no. so. Oh, it's not a game. It's not a game. It's not a game. No, it's no, not it's a game. Not a game. No, no, it's not a game. Just fun. Yeah. So it's a book project? I can't say anything else. I can't say anything else. No, no, no. no, no. All right, I'm just. Fun. It's fun. <laughs> All right, so it's been fun uh, talking to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we had some technical problems before we had to actually re redo the whole interview. Things, uh, no, things have been uh, much, much more smooth this time. It's obviously because we were both using Macs. I think that can be expensive. <laughs> uh, uh, no, thank you. I, I really enjoy this as well. I'm, I'm very honored about being on this show that has a Commodore tune as its main theme, uh, it's a dream come true for me. <laughs> thank you very much. No, thank you. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week. Got some fantastic guests lining up. I have yet to do the interviews, though, so I won't make any promises. Uh, but if these go through, I know you're going to be excited, so stay tuned uh, for those. Also, want to thank everybody who has been donating. I've been been able to fill my drinking horn with some really excellent brews lately. As a matter of fact, uh, when I'm done recording, I intend to enjoy this lovely horny goat. Uh, this is a Belgian-style wheat beer brewed in uh, Wisconsin, actually. Uh, so hopefully those, hopefully they, uh, those unions won't go on strike because I uh, would really like to continue to enjoy my horny goat, and so would my horn. Uh, now, as uh, usual, I thought I would leave you with a quotation. Or another reading, actually. Uh, this from H.P. Lovecraft's uh, most famous uh, story, I believe, uh, The Call of Cthulhu, as I believe how you pronounce that. But anyway, it's a great, um, a great passage here. I just thought I'd read the first part of this, because it really set the tone if you want to uh, know what H.P. Lovecraft is all about. So this is uh, from The Call of Cthulhu, uh, part one. Very famous passage here. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of a black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. <laughs> fantastic prose, isn't, isn't that fantastic prose? H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, if you haven't ever read him, by, uh, by all means, get to Amazon, get a copy of this, I know you'll enjoy it. That's all for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next time. To get you, Barbara. Hi guys, Matt Barton here. I wanted to share with you a game that I created over spring break. This is called Mayhem, or Mayhem by Matt. And as you can see, it's a little bit of a cross between Great Gianna Sisters and Mario Brothers, uh, with a bit of 1942 and even a little breakout thrown in, the destructible terrain. It's got th uh, four different types of enemies, uh, probably a good ten different types of power-ups, a high score table, <laughs> lots of bonuses. Uh, moving platforms. I think this will keep you entertained for quite a while. Uh, you can download this for free either at armchairarcade.com or at yoyogames.com. Uh, if you do go to Yoyo uh, Yo -Yo Games, you can also rate it and review it. So uh, please do that. Let me know what you think and hope you have fun. <laughs>